Okay, good morning, everybody, and Hazak Baruch. Thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful Monday morning. Monday morning, everybody, and Shavuot Tov. New week, uh, new week, new perasha, and a lot going on in this perasha, of course. My friends, uh, this week we study perashat Shelah, Shelah Lecha. Okay, the famous uh, perasha that deals primarily with the sin of the spies. Okay, Shelah Lecha Anashim, where... Perasha begins and God commands Moshe to send spies to the land of Israel. And it's important to note, my friends, first of all, that um, the, whose, whose idea was this to send spies? Who thought about it? So we don't really get so much color here in this perasha. And it's something beautiful you need to know about the Torah is that sometimes... If you want to get a bigger idea of the picture here, you got to look somewhere else. Well, our parasha is repeated. It's repeated at the end of the 40 years. When Moshe Rabbeinu is uh, telling this generation that's about to enter the land of Israel, right before he dies, he tells them about the last 40 years. And uh, if you turn to Parashat Devarim, he tells them about this episode. He tells them about the spies. Okay, so he says like this. You all came and you said, hey Moshe, we want to send spies. So they can see the land from where attack, etc. Okay. I thought it was a good idea. Okay, Moshe says, I thought it was a good idea. So you see over here that the Jewish people are the ones that initiated this request. Right? Now, if you turn to our perasha, it's not so clear like that. Turn to our perasha, my friends, perasha shelah, and it's a little bit of a different color. It says, God said to Moshe, shelah lecha anashim. Our perasha begins, God saying to Moshe, send spies to the land of Israel. So if all you had was our parasha, it would sound like God's the one who's initiating this request. Moshe sends spies, right? But, but the truth is it was the Jewish people that requested it. And Moshe was okay, and God himself wasn't opposed. Right here, the parasha begins, Shelah lecha anashim. Okay? Now the question really is, and, and for this we're going to turn to the Rabbeinu Bachir together. And we're going to see a beautiful piece today, very important piece. But the real question that he's going to answer is, um, why are we sending spies? Why are we sending spies? At the end of the day, who's the one that's, that's really fighting for us? It's God. God's the one that's doing it. So what are we wasting our time? Where to attack, from where, how big are the people, uh, strategize. What do you need to strategize? What are you strategizing? God's the one doing it. He's in charge. Anyways, God's fighting for us. So what are we wasting our time sending spies? Go straight ahead. You don't need to do, you don't need to think. Just act. Yeah? This is going to be the question of Rabbeinu Bachir. Okay. Baruch atah nunai lenu mechalam shakol niye baruch. My friends, let us study today a very, very important piece from Rabbeinu Bachir. Please turn, if you have it, right to the introduction of our parasha. The parasha, he begins, of course, every parasha with an introduction from a pasuk in Mishle and Proverbs. And today's pasuk is in chapter 21, pas, uh, pasuk 31, verse 31. The verse says in Mishle, Sus muhan leyom milhama. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. Vila Hashem ha But victory comes from God. Very, very, very interesting pasuk. Shlomo HaMelech here is telling us, that the horse is ready for battle, but the victory comes from God. Explains Rabbeinu Bachir that Shlomo HaMelech here is warning. Kol Adam, he's warning every person. She kol davar she la'asot. That in life you have to do everything within your ability possible to do. Whatever is in your hands, you must do. When it comes to anything in life, you got to do all the preparation necessary. 
And then, after you did all your due diligence, in Hebrew it's called Hishtadlut, after you do your part, after we try, after we prepared, after we exerted our energy and after we planned, the rest is in God's hands. Kihanes, because you need to know, my friends, that miracles in life, enohal ela behesron hateva. Miracles only come, look at this very, this is such an important paragraph. But miracles only come from above if the only thing that's missing is the miracle. Meaning so long that there are certain things that we can still do within our ability, God will not do a miracle. He says you should know that, the, that everything in life, primarily the problems that we have in our world, in our lives, are things that can be solved using nature, using natural means. A person in life is not supposed to rely on God. A person in life is not supposed to sit back and rely on and wait for a miracle. A person who's waiting for a shiduch is not allowed to just sit there and say, don't worry if it's meant to be, it's going to come knocking on my door. Wrong. You got to do everything in your power. La'asot u'bederech ha'teva kol ma shebeyado. You got to do everything that's in your ability. A, person, a couple that's unfortunately infertile, they're not supposed to sit and wait for a miracle. Do everything that you can. You're supposed to see specialists. You're supposed to see doctors. A person that's sick, not supposed to sit back and wait. You have to do everything that you can. And therefore, A person needs to do whatever it is that they think they need to do in order to bring about the results that they want. To get their desire uh, fulfilled. Just like, If you want to go to battle, what do you got to do for battle? If you're going to war, you got to prepare the chariots. You got to prepare the weapons. You got to prepare the horses. You got to be prepared for battle. You can't sit around playing sheshbesh and then uh, with the attitude that uh, it's okay, God's going to win for us anyways. You can't sit around doing nothing. You can't be irresponsible. Because if you're not going to prepare... If you're going to rely on a miracle, know that you're going to be given over to your enemies. God's not going to come down and do miracles for you when you were negligent in your due diligence, when you were lazy in doing what you needed to do to prepare for this. Or if somebody is sick, you got to prepare the foods, the remedies, the medicines. You got to eat healthy food. <clears throat> you got to stay away <clears throat> from the <clears throat> from the food that's going to hurt you. <clears throat> you can't be lax. You can't be irresponsible. The person's not feeling good. It's okay. I can eat what I want. I could smoke what I want. I could do what I want. Anyways, Hashem is in charge of health. That's the wrong hashkafa, my friends. Abinu Bakhya here is saying very strong. Not to think like that in life. You can't sit back. You can't do the wrong things. Rather, you got to do everything that you can. And once you did, you tried everything within your natural ability and capability. And within the natural limits, you did everything preparatory that's possible. Here's, here's the challenge. You ready? The challenge is once you did everything possible, now you must realize that the only reason that you were healthy at the end, the only reason you found the shidduh, the only reason we had the child, the only reason we did the success at the end, was rak bashemit aleh. The challenge was realizing after I'm done, that I only got what I wanted because Hashem helped me. Lo bahachanot ha'eleh. And that my hachanot really did for me zero. That is wild. Imagine you have a meeting, you're preparing, and Rabbi Nubach is saying very loud and clear, you got to prepare for that meeting. You got to sit down with your team, you got to strategize, 
how are we going to pitch it? What are we going to sell? What are we going to, what's the order? What are we going to say? What do they like? Should we buy them tickets to the Yankees or the Mets? Or if it's a Subway series, then you're good, right? And, um, and when you're done and you get the sale and they purchase to place an order, you got to realize that we only got this order because Hashem. And it's nothing to do with our strategizing and with our deal make nothing. Ve'yesh choleh, and because he says, I'll prove it to you. You can have a choleh she'yamut imam ha'achlim ha'moyelim. There are some sick people that die even with the best medicine. Ve'yesh and some, she'tagia lo refu'ah imam ha'achlim ha'ra'im ha'mazikim. Some people get health even while doing the wrong things. They're eating dangerous foods. And if so, any kara chua beinan ha'melhama velo beinan refu'ah la'achronotahem rak b'ashem it'aleh. We need to realize and remember and know, my friends, that the salvation came in the battle or the health or whatever area of life did not come because of our preparation, only because Hashem. And that is really the tightrope that we're walking in life, that we got to do everything possible, but we got to know that it's all Hashem, which is very hard to do. Because I could hear how somebody, I could hear... That if a person does zero, sit back all day, and then the sale, the business comes in, it's very easy to say this God. Or I sit and do nothing, and then the shiduch comes, I sit and say back, that's God. But now, you want me, you want me to say that I'm supposed to do everything, and then when, I, when, it, went, when it went well, all my hard work was zero. That's very hard to do. It's really a difficult balance. It's a very difficult balance. I remember hearing one time, beautiful idea. <clears throat> you know, originally before Adam sinned, right? They were on trees, grew actual pieces of bread. So the Zohar writes, bread grew on the tree. When the sin came, then it became instead of bread, wheat. And part of the punishment of Adam, bezeat apecha tochal lehem. What does that mean? It means that you got to eat with the sweat of your brow. So part of the punishment of Adam was, you ready for this? That you have to take the wheat. Once upon a time, bread grew. Bread grew from the earth. But no, now it's wheat that's growing from the earth. And you got to take that wheat and you got to, right? First you got to plant the seeds. Then you got to water it. And then when it grows in its wheat, then you got to harvest it. Then you got to take the kernels and you got to grind and smash and everything, right? That's involved in the winnowing process and the, and the sifting process. And then you got to take the, the, all the kernels and make flour out of it. And then you got to take the flour and add water and knead it and bake it into a bread. And after months and months and months, where you finally have a beautiful, warm, ah, oh, yummy, delicious loaf of bread, a baguette, or whatever it is that you like, right? Comme c'est bon, how beautiful, right? Bon appetit. You got to take the bread. And after all your hard work and your sweat, you got to say, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Hamoti Lehem Min Haaretz. God, you gave me this bread. You made this bread. You took this bread out of the earth. Not, you gave me wheat that I made into bread. No, 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 no. You gave me the bread. After all my hard work, I have to be able to take the bread that I put my hard work and money and time and sweat and tears into. And I got to say, God, it's your bread. Thank you for giving me bread. That, my friends, is the punishment of Adam HaRishon. That's the test ever since he ate from that tree. So part of life is realizing that Hashem is the one that heals. The Pasuk says in Tehillim, we say it every day in the in Shaharit, Um God is one that heals. At the end of the day, it's not the strength of the horses or your army or your military or your, in, your intelligence unit. It's not about your calves or your thighs. Does that mean that your soldiers should be scrawny men that are sitting all day uh, doing nothing for their physical health? Of course not. It's very loud and clear. Do everything that you need to for a soldier, whatever that looks like. Boot camp, training, you need strong, strong men. 
You need big th- big thighs and calves. You need muscle. You need intelligence unit. You need horses. Whatever you need. You need all the best. But realize, my friends, Sheker Hasus Lechua. That the horse, at the end of the day, is false for salvation. That's, that's the wild, this dichotomy. That we're living, we're dancing in these two different truths. That on the one hand, I got to do everything. And on the other hand, I got to realize that I did nothing. Right? Zot kavanat Torah v'rova poskim And this is really something the psukim prove. So as an example, look at this, as an example. A person, when they're going to battle, when the Jewish people are coming out to war, they have to gather as many soldiers as possible. Right? When they're going out against the enemy. You got to prepare. You got to plan. You got to strategize. Prepare for ambush. Anything possible that's needed within normal Whatever, whatever the world thinks uh, armies need to do to be successful. You should send spies to go spy out the enemy. You got to know the lay of the land. You got to do due diligence. Because all of these things, my friends, ultimately are things that are within our means, within our abilities to do. However, a heart can. And when you're done doing everything, you fall on this. Then the miracle can come. And even though the Jewish people maybe didn't need to send spies. Because anyways, when you look at history, how did we win? How did we defeat the nations that we went to conquer in Israel? We ended up doing a miracle anyways. <laughs> anyways, we walked around Yericho seven times. Until the walls of Jericho sink, right? That's that's not natural. That's a miracle. Okay, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure how exactly that ties into why the wife walks around the husband in the Ashkenazi wedding seven times. You know, I'm not sure what she's trying to insinuate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe uh, okay. But either way, either way, right? This is a miracle. This is not something natural that the walls of Jericho sink, sunk, right? Anyways, we win not because of nature. Why do we win battles? We win because of our merits or our lack of merits. Or we lose because of our lack of merits. We know that. We know that before the Jewish people went out to battle, we had a Kohen who stood up there, a, a, a big general, Tzadik, would get up and announce, anyone who just got married, go home. Anyone who just built a house, go home. Anyone who just planted a vineyard, go home. And anyone who is afraid of their sins go home. Yeah. Ultimately, why do we why do we win? We win because we have God. We win because of our merits. Foolish is a person who thinks that you can have a country, a state of Israel that's built only on war and muscle and politics. To have a state of Israel that's not also founded on Torah and Mizvot is pointless. Ultimately, our strength comes. Because of our because of our righteousness, because of the zechuyot, because of the mitzvot. Now, one hundred percent, you need an army. One hundred percent, you got to do everything within your means naturally that you think you need to do to win to be successful. And then the the miracle comes. But we know that our our champion comes because of zechuyot, because of mitzvot. If you have a little bit of merit, you could defeat wondrous nations, empires. And if a few are guilty, then uh, you'll lose to the smallest country. Nonetheless, although we know deep down that ultimately our success comes because of our mitzvot or lack of, nonetheless, the Torah comes and tells the Jewish people, La'asot kol that we have to do everything, my friends, everything that we can within our means. We cannot be lazy in life. We cannot be irresponsible. We cannot make wrong choices. And then at the end, just wave it off. It's okay, because anyways, God is in charge. What are you talking about God is in charge? Yes, God is in charge. But you cannot do the wrong things, because if you do the wrong things, let me tell you what, God will not come to help you. 
He only does miracles when you exhausted everything within your means possible. That's the line. After you do everything, then, yes, point up to God. But don't point up to God as an excuse for your laziness. Sometimes you see people like this. They make wrong choices. They do the wrong things. The guy is bad in his, in his uh, behavior. He's rude. He lacks class. He does the wrong things in dating. And then when the girl breaks up, he says, oh, it wasn't meant to be. He blames God. It's okay. Hashem has a bigger plan for me. No, you uh, fool. That's not how Hashem works. Do what you need to do. Be a gentleman. Do the right thing. And then God will come and do miracles for you. But you can't lack all the possible, right? You can't do all the wrong things and then blame God when it doesn't go the right way. That's not how it works. Because you need to know, my friends, that God will never rely on a miracle. And that's why God commanded Noah to build the ark. Think about this. Couldn't God really just allow Noah to walk on water? What's his name did it, right? <laughs> Other people have walked on water. We could have just go through the... Do a miracle, God. You don't need Noah to start building arcs and certain wood and certain size. Right? Anyways, you should know, the whole ark was a miracle. You can't actually fit all that amount of animals in that amount of space. All the food, all the garbage, you can't fit it. It's, take the dimensions of the ark. Either way, the whole thing was a miracle. So what are you bothering Noah for 120 years to build you an ark? But the answer is, like we've said, that God wants that we should do whatever necessary, whatever possible. And then when we're done, Tihye emunatenu, our belief system is she'en ikara chua bahem that our success didn't come through these means. Rak bashem itale, only, only through God. That's a very powerful idea, my friends. Such an important hashkafa philosophy, outlook, approach to life. That a person needs to know that I got to do whatever I can within my ability to bring the results that I would like. But at the end of it all, I have to be able to point up and say. God, it was really thanks to you. That's the pasuk. Sus muhan leyom el hama. The horse has to be ready for battle. You can't, you can't not be ready for battle. You can't live life with this flippant attitude that it's okay. I don't need to prepare. I trust in Hashem. You can't live like that. You got to prepare the horse, and then when you're done. La Hashem Hachua, then Hashem will bring the salvation. We find similar by David Amelech when he asked in regards to fighting the Pelishtim, he asked the Urim Betumim. And what did God say? God told him, Go and prepare. And when you hear the leaves crack, then you know to come from behind. He, he, he's talking to David as if it's like a whole strategy going on. Why? You're God. God, do whatever you need to do. Let us win. Or with Yehoshua in the city of Ai. There was an Orev, there was an ambush. Why? Because that's the rule in life. In life we have to do our due diligence. And if that's the case, my friends, And that's why Moses in our parasha sends the spies. He sends the spies. Because in life, you have to do what's responsible. And part of fighting battles is sending spies. You need to know from where to go. Although you're Moshe and you know you have God on your back, on your team. But you can't rely on God unless you first exhausted every possible avenue within your capability. So our parasha begins now. Shelah lecha anashim ve'yaturu. The pasuk of here is saying, Shem sha'alu ha'inyan. The, the people, really, the people are the ones, like we pointed out, requested this. Nishlecha anashim lefanim. We want to send people, Moshe, to know how do we fight, from where to enter. Right? Now, 
And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That's completely allowed. God says, go. Now, there is an opinion of Rashi here, which needs to be understood. Rashi Perash, Rashi writes, Shelah lecha ledatecha. Rashi says, send in according to your own judgment. Ani eni metzavelecha. I'm not commanding you to do this. I'll leave it up to you. From Rashi, it sounds like God was not a fan of this. It sounds like God is telling Moshe, listen, you want to send spies, then go for it. But I, I'm, I'm okay not sending spies. Explains Rabbi Nubachye. Rabbi here, very important. Listen to what he's saying. Because what's Rashi saying? That God didn't endorse this? But look at the Pasuk. Pasuk 3 of our parasha. Vayishlah hotam Moshe mimidbar paran alpi Adonai. Moshe sends them from the desert of Paran alpi Adonai through the word of God. So it sounds like very clearly God's the one sending them. So what exactly is Rashi saying? That God's saying, no, I'm not really a fan of this. So he explains. Lo bertsono. The thought initiated from the people. Because you wanted it, God, look at this. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar is teaching you over here sometimes in life. God will put his stamp on something that he didn't initially uh, uh, think of. Uh, you thought of it. You want to do it. So God says, okay, you can do it. Like a parent sometimes, right? Uh, my uh, father, father's going uh, for dinner. We're going to make barbecue. The kid comes and says, Dad, I want, uh, I want pizza. So he says, okay, you could have pizza. Right? I was going to give you barbecue, but if you want pizza, it's okay, you could have pizza. So sometimes in life, we could have our own opinion of what to do, and God is okay with that. Right? God says, I'm not necessarily pushing spies. If you want spies, you could have spies, no problem. Do we, do you, can you think of another example like this, by the way? Where it was the people's idea and Hashem was okay with it? Making a king. Right? When it came to making a king, whose idea was that? God, ideally, would rather have no king system. But he understood the pressure politically of having a king. People are going to want it. He said, sometimes it's okay, so you can put a king. You want a king, have a king. Lo aita no. It wasn't God's thought. It wasn't his uh, idea. Yeah? But it's okay. It's not against, I'm not against it either. Yes? Fine. Furthermore, explains Rabbi Nubachye, Shelah lecha anashim. What does that mean, Shelah lecha? Shelah lecha letu'alatcha. For your benefit. What does that mean? God says to Moshe, send for your benefit. Right? We find a few examples that the word lecha is always hinting that it's for your advantage. God over here says to Moshe, Shelah lecha. So simply, what does lecha mean? Like Rashi said, send uh, for you. It's your idea. I'm okay without it, but if you want it, you could have it. That's simple. But over here, Rashi is saying, uh, over here, Rabbi Nubachia says a little bit deeper. Look at this, very, very beautiful. God saying to Moshe, actually, Moshe, Sending spies will be for your advantage. Why? How will it help Moshe if to send spies? The benefit was because by sending spies, look at this, now Moshe is going to have 40 more years to live. Because if they didn't send spies, they didn't send spies. They would have gone into Israel immediately. And what would have happened if they go into Israel immediately? If Sharlolikanes, Moshe would not be allowed to enter the land. Now you may stop and say, one second, Rabbi. But if they enter, if, if they enter the land immediately, then Moshe would have gone in. Because what's the reason Moshe didn't go into the land of Israel? What sin did Moshe do that he was punished? He sinned by hitting the rock. But that only happened later. If they wouldn't have sinned with the spies, then he would have never hit the rock, and he would have gone into Israel. No? Says Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, no. 
Even without the sin of the rock. You need to know that Moshe was never going to enter Israel. From day one, it was clear he was not going in. Because God told him by Paro, Now you will see what I'll do to Paro. And our rabbis tell us, Now you'll see. But you won't see the 31 kings of Canaan that were going to defeat. It was already part of the game plan from the beginning that Moshe is not going to go into the land of Israel. So says Rabbi Nubachi over here something very beautiful. That actually, by the Jewish people delaying, staying outside of the land of Israel, by the Jewish people staying outside of the land of Israel, Moshe is going to now have longer time to live. You see, the sin of the spies came to help him. It ended up being for his benefit. Because now, 38 more years in the desert, that's going to help him. He's going to be alive for 38 more years. If the spies don't go, if the spies don't sin, we enter Israel immediately, Moshe dies at the age of 82. But now, 38 more years because of the sin of the spies. And God is hinting this. God saying, Moshe, shalach lecha. Ultimately, this sending of the spies is going to help you. It's giving you 38 more years. Which explains to us further something a little bit deeper. We know Moshe prays for Yehoshua. Moshe blesses Yehoshua. He changes his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. He adds a Yud. Because the Yud K has God's name. Yehoshua. The first two letters, Yud K, it's God's name. Moshe is adding God's name. That he, Hashem should help you, Yehoshua. Not to full pray to the plan of the spies. But it's very, very interesting when you think about it, that he prays for Yehoshua. Why doesn't he pray for anybody else? I mean, it seems like Moshe knew there was a risk here. Moshe knows that by sending spies, there's something bad that could happen. Sending spies could actually come to hurt us. So if sending spies is going to hurt us, why are you sending them? I mean, you prayed for Yehoshua. You knew there was a risk. You knew that something could go wrong. You knew that there's danger here by praying for Yehoshua. It means that you're under the you're under the understanding that it's very clear to you that there's something going on. So why are you only praying for Yehoshua and nobody else? The answer is something very very deep. Moshe knew that all other eleven spies have a plan of trying to do the wrong thing. There may be something arrogance, ego, bias for whatever reason. That they're going to they're gonna spread lies. But my friends, what about Yehoshua? Does Yehoshua have an opinion in all of this? What's Yehoshua's, what's, what's his stance? Does he want to go in? Does he not want? What is Yehoshua's opinion? Well, if you think about it, Yehoshua just last week heard, he just last week heard the prophecy of Eldad Umedad. Listen to this. Remember last week the Jewish people were complaining? Yes? Jewish people were complaining, right? That's what we do best. Okay, so we're complaining. And Moshe is like, hey, Jack, I had enough, God. I can't, I can't, I can't do this. So God says, no problem. Let me give you some help. Let me give you some assistance. Let me give you uh, elders to help you in dealing with the people. How many elders? 70. Well, if you do the math, 70 doesn't go into 12 tribes equally. 12 goes into 72 equally. 12 times 6 is 72. So we need 6 representatives from every tribe. But two tribes will only have 5. Okay? So how are you going to know, take 6, how are you going to know which of these 72 people you got to kick two out? So Moshe took 72 pieces of paper. 70 of them had elder. Two of them, empty. And each person is going to pick up a piece of paper. And if yours says empty, then goodbye, right? Good luck and goodbye. So <clears throat> Moshe Rabbeinu gathers these 72 and he tells them to grab a piece of paper. But there were two people out of these 72 that were very humble. And they, they knew what was going on. They did the math. They realized that two of them are out. And they didn't want that two other elders should be embarrassed and get kicked out. So you know what they did? They volunteered to be out. They willingly stayed away from everybody. They said, we're not in. We're, we, we, we resign. 
Let the other 70 go. An amazing portrayal of humility. And what ended up happening was that these two guys got prophecy anyways. Even without Moshe putting his hands on them, they became prophets. And they started saying prophetic things, scary things. They started saying the following. Moshe met the Yehoshua Machnis. Moshe will die and Yehoshua will bring him. And who's standing there by Moshe's side 24-7? Yehoshua. So Yehoshua hears this prophecy. You see, it's not only the 11 spies that want to stay outside of Israel. Yehoshua also doesn't want to go into Israel. Because Yehoshua knows that the second they go into Israel, he's going to become the leader and his Rebbe Moshe, who he loves, is going to die. And Moshe knew that Yehoshua, a piece of him, a part of him, was going to lie along with the spies to stay outside of the land for the right reason. Not for the wrong reason. Out of humility. So his Rebbe could stay alive. And that's why Moshe prays for Yehoshua. Because in life, when someone's doing the wrong thing, there's, there's a chance that he's going to shape up. That he's going to wake up. That he's going to maybe not do the wrong thing. The scariest thing in life is when a person's doing the wrong thing and he thinks it's the right thing. The most dangerous of the 12 spies was Yehoshua. Because Yehoshua was the one, Yehoshua was the one, believe it or not, who actually had only pure motives to do the wrong thing. Out of all 12, he would have been the happiest to lie so that they stay out, so that his rabbi stays alive, so that Moshe doesn't die. And, this, and he knew this. He knew exactly what Rabbi Nubakhe is saying over here. Shelach lecha, that ultimately Moshe sending the spies is going to help you because you're going to get 38 more years. And Yehoshua would have been happy. So Moshe has to pray for Yehoshua not to lie, to say the truth. And it, ends up, it ends up working. The other 10 say the negative things. They say the lies. And Yehoshua ends up saying the truth. Although the truth is going to hurt him. For Yehoshua saying the truth means we go into Israel today and my rabbi dies today. But Yehoshua did what was, what was right. He didn't let the ends justify the means. Now, he ended up winning either way because they ended up staying outside of Israel for 38 years. So he told the truth and his rabbi stayed alive because they didn't go into Israel. It was a win-win for Yehoshua. But this is what God is saying. Shelach lecha letovatcha. So this is my friends, my, my friends, very powerful Rabbi Nubach here, um, reminding us, reminding us how really in life we got to be responsible. We got to do what's right. You got to do your due diligence. We cannot be lax. We cannot be irresponsible. We cannot be lazy. We cannot point up to the heavens and say, God will do everything for me. Hashem does miracles. I don't need to go to work today. I don't need to go to work this week or this month or this year. I don't have to date correctly. I could stick to my, I could stick to all of my preferences on my list. I don't have to give in on anything because Hashem's going to make the right guy come in. I don't know. I don't know. In life, you got to be responsible. That means that you got to play the game. In dating, what does that look like? That there are some, sometimes I have to give in on certain things. Hashem could do a miracle. He could bring you the best guy. But that's only after provided that we did our best. In health, we got to do everything that we can to take care of our health. In finances, in relationships, person can't sit back and say, God, give me Shalom Bayit. What are you doing for your Shalom Bayit? What, you what, what book are you reading? What, what classes are you going to about having a good marriage? Help my son. Help my son go down the right path. I want my children to be righteous. I want my children to stay Jewish, to marry Jewish. Well, what are we doing about it? Of course, ultimately, all success comes from God. But today's Pasuk, my friend, Shlomo HaMelech reminds us loud and clear. Sus muchan leyomel chamayab. Is your horse prepared? Is your horse prepared? If our horse is prepared, then Hashem will come and Hashem will do miracles. Be'ezat Hashem will, will be led to victory. Okay, we'll stop over here, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.